Hello and welcome to the AIM webinar series. My name is Mike Allen and I serve AIM Inc. as their member engagement manager. AIM is the trusted worldwide industry association for the automatic identification industry. For nearly half a century, AIM has provided unbiased information, educational resources, and standards to providers and users of these technologies. AIM membership provides access to an insider's perspective on trends and opportunities, along with a voice in shaping the growth and future of the industry. AIM member benefits include education, advocacy, and community, as well as a role in creating industry standards through collaboration. AIM is an investment in your future. Before the presentation starts, I would like to direct your attention to your monitor to review a few housekeeping items. First, you will notice that you are muted throughout the presentation. Please do not use the raise hand option during this webinar presentation. If you have any questions during the webinar, please click the chat icon on the top right of your screen. After this, you'll see a chat dialog box at the bottom right of your screen. Make sure in the Send To box you select AIM Inc. and then in the box below type your question. We will try to answer as many questions as we can after the presentation. Today's presenter is Omni ID CEO George Dattis Jr. George, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. I really appreciate your time. Um, we've got uh, uh, a couple of case studies, some interesting IoT technologies used in factories that we'd like to talk to you about tonight uh, or today. I know your time is valuable, so we'll just we'll move through uh, uh, quite briskly. But uh, I would love to uh, catch any questions you folks might have at the end of the presentation, and uh, uh, we'll answer them as fully as we can. Uh, first, a quick uh, little background on Omni ID. We've been in the marketplace for uh, you know well over 10 years. Uh, our original uh, heritage stems from on metal or harsh environment industrial RFID tags. Uh, we have since branched out. Uh, to a number of uh, different other technologies, including active tags and label products, and ultimately the visual tags that we'll be talking about today. But that core legacy business still uh, uh, forms uh, the division inside Omni ID we call Enterprise Asset Management Solutions. So um, uh, on this side of the business, if you've got something to tag uh, and keep track of uh, from the very hardest applications, like uh, a paint, shoe, uh, paint booth shop, uh, high temperature tags, all the way to just straight uh, container tags. This is the type of uh, these are the type of products that we sell here. On the manufacturing solutions, this is a new area that we launched oh about uh, three four years ago. Uh, we call the the flagship product here ProView, and it's really what we'll be talking about today. Uh, the manufacturing solutions we're going to be discussing are focused primarily on the following mission: material flow in large capital goods manufacturing. In short, the, our mission is to get the right part to the right place at the right time. And so we'll talk on, um, in fact, most of the rest of the presentation will be about, uh, about this, uh, this division. All right, let's move ahead. Uh, we're going to illustrate the point by talking about uh, a specific case study that we've done. Um, in fact, obviously an entire implementation here with Detroit Diesel. Uh, it's a division of Daimler. Um, and uh, in this factory, you'll be hearing about our work instructions uh, product line. But as we get through with this first case study, we'll do a brief tour of some of the other material flows. But in short, what we've done is uh, looked at the factory over a period of years and uh, categorized the different types of material movements that you see on factory floors in a couple of different spots. And uh, uh, work instructions or build books uh, is the one that we'll be highlighting first here. Okay. Now, Detroit Diesel is a, uh, a great customer. Uh, they build engines for these very large Freightliner trucks amongst many other uh, types of deliveries. The very interesting thing about their job is, uh, probably like most of you in manufacturing these days, these days, every work item is starting to become extraordinarily customized. Uh, this essentially means they're building batches of one. Uh, they had to build an engine from stem to stern, uh, they'll have up to 60, 70 workstations, each one with a customizable set of steps. Uh, they might put intake manifolds on the left or the right. They'll tune the, uh, uh, the fuel systems for uh, certain uh, emissions and mileage and torque ratios. Uh, the fittings are all different for the different trucks. So everything can be uh, up for grabs when it comes to customization. This meant that they needed to print very large volumes of work instructions that would travel along with those engines, which were mounted on AGVs or automatically guided vehicles, 
Um, and every operator at each station, each of those 70 stations, would have to thumb through the build book pages and find the right instruction for that engine at their step. Um, this resulted in approximately 7 million uh, pages of paper being printed annually. Um, and that wasn't even really half the problem. Latency, uh, just because of this printing on building an engine, was uh, very, very high. The time to print a build book, and obviously they printed them in large batches, was approximately a week. And then they, uh, in that period of time, they had a number of markups. So you'd end up going through those build books again, marking them up um, and making corrections. So it was quite a long time from order to even beginning the build process. Never mind the cost in paper and running people out to the floor or misplaced uh, um, build book pages and such. So when we uh, arrived, we looked at tackling that problem head on with our, our work instructions application. I'm going to talk about the details of this over the next several slides here, but uh, we uh, proposed the use of a 10 inch wide view tag. And we'll, uh, a view tag uh, is essentially an IoT device that takes the place of a piece of paper. In other words, you can, it has a display and you can look at it and interact with it just as if you were looking at and reading a piece of paper on the build book. But it also is outfitted with a significant amount of IoT technology sensors and tracking. So you know where it is um, out on the factory floor, it can sense uh, movement through accelerometers, uh, the number of buttons to interact with, LEDs, things like that. So it's a true intelligent uh, device out there that um, essentially is being smart paper uh, to replace the uh, build, uh, dumb paper printouts of the build books. Okay. All right, let's move ahead. All right, quick look at the hardware. We'll go through a couple of the components of the system uh, from bottom up here, but uh, obviously it starts with a tag. There's a family of tags. Uh, for build books, our work instruction type applications, we tend to use our larger tag, and we call that the view 10. The number represents the diagonal um, measurement in inches, much like you would buy a TV, a 60-inch TV or 55-inch TV, et cetera. So the view 10 is approximately the size of a, uh, of a piece of letter-sized paper, your normal business paper. Um, and uh, uh, it's the one that has a sufficient amount of area to display some really pretty rich uh, build instructions, images and uh, text and all that. Now, into all of these uh, view tags, we go all the way down to three inch, uh, we uh, have a number of different technologies built in. Of course, there's human interaction that we have to allow for, uh, and so you see buttons and LEDs. We also have a number of sensors um, and triggers built in. We call them triggers because oftentimes we use them to figure out when they've arrived someplace or when an event has occurred. You know, so the tag might signal, for example, when it was lifted up by a forklift um, through an accelerometer and that would trigger an action. Or a RFID uh, could be uh, read so that uh, you know when it has arrived at a certain location. Um, so lots of different triggers. Um, in the V10s, they actually have an infrared that we'll talk about later. Um, you'll see how we use that here. Industrial strength batteries, uh, the smaller formats actually have the batteries built in and they last five years. Uh, really, really good, strong, long um, um, battery life. On the big V10, there's enough room for us to put a uh, uh, rechargeable battery. And in work instructions applications, uh, because of the way we designed it and the technologies we've chosen, you can actually run for weeks uh, without recharging a V10. Uh, so it uh, uh, makes it very, very low maintenance and easy to use. And of course, there's no power cords or anything of that nature. Very rugged case. These things are built for the factory floor. These are not, um, you know, signage or whatnot that's been repurposed. These are built from the ground up for factories. Um, there's rubber bumpers built around them. You can drop them uh, right onto concrete factory floors from chest high. Um, and there are no openings on the side. You know, so, uh, you know, even in the case of the V10 tag where you recharge it, that's all done with wireless recharging. So there's very good protection against dust and all the other types of things that uh, are prevalent in a, in a factory environment. And we have two radios, lots of ways to communicate with these tags. There's an active radio, and I also know you guys probably have some familiarity with the different types of RAD technologies, but, uh, um, you know, active radios are actually battery-powered radios that beacon out just like your, you know, AM... FM radio stations. Um, they have the virtue of uh, being able to go over long distances. 
Uh, they can burn through all sorts of interferences. Reliability in terms of reads or uh, communications is very high. And uh, because of the long distance read, you can of often use them in real time location systems, which we do. Uh, real time location, for those of you not familiar, is where the tag will beacon out and you'll have a number of different readers listening in. And they, through measurement of signal strength at each of the different readers, they kind of triangulate the position of your tag. So you can uh, have your tag beacon out and you will be able to track it uh, pretty close to real time right on there on the factory floor. And then with the other type of way of communication we have is actually passive RFID. So all of these tags will operate like passive tags. In other words, you can take your standard RFID readers just like you would buy off the shelf and be able to read these tags. And what's more, you could actually load an application on your readers that if you didn't want to use the active reader, you could actually change and update the screens and, um, and images through a passive RFID. Standard technology, standard readers, any reader will work. That's a quick tour of the ProView visual tags. Um, we'll talk about how we arrived at these designs and these features a little bit later, but for the purpose of this conversation, I just wanted you to become familiar with the hardware here. Okay. All right, so work instructions. Remember the main mission here is to replace a package of 60, 70, 100 pages, or whatever it be, of papers on a big truck engine as it travels through 60 or 70 different uh, value centers or workstations. Okay. So what do we need to make the system work? Well, there is there is a server, um, a very simple, basic server. People are deploying these types of things all the time. This will operate on uh, a customer's VM, uh, virtual machines, or you can place a PC there, you can put it in the cloud. Just your standard issue server and run on the application. Uh, as with most modern pieces of software, the GUI interfaces, the clients, are written as web clients these days. That means that you can have a tablet, you know, phone, a PC workstation anywhere in the plant that is able to see the server and you can bring up the GUI. Okay, so this works really well for mobile workers who might have tablets, or it might work well for the, you know, the people behind the glass wall uh, that, you know, want to monitor the system or grab reports or what have you. Um, and you don't, you know, pay for additional installations and you don't pay for, um, you know, all the maintenance and headaches that uh, multiple installs brings. So that's the software um, uh, environment. We'll talk more about the structure of the software a little bit later, but. Um, the rest of the system, of course, comprised of the tags that we use to put on the individual engines, and they travel with the engines as they go through their build process. And the way we communicate with the tags, in this instance, with V10s, we use standard issue Wi-Fi Ethernet. So in our Detroit Diesel case study, we just used the Ethernet that was already hanging around uh, through the ceilings. Uh, wireless access points were pre previously installed and just communicate uh, to the tags via that mechanism. Now, one of the uh, one important function here is to know what tag is associated with which engine, so you can get the right instructions for that engine, but also to know uh, what station you're at. And when you just arrived at a station, you want to display the right set of instructions for that station and that engine. Now, like I alluded to before, there's a lot of different ways you can detect location of your tags. You can do real-time location, as we described before. You could put up um, RFID readers that when the engine becomes, let's say, within a foot or two of the reader, it serves as a trigger to the system to let you know you're there. In our particular case study here, we happen to use infrared uh, triggers. So in the ceiling, we hang infrared emitter, emitters. They're the same type of technology you use to switch the channels on your TV. Um, and these things beam out codes that uh, uh, identify a specific location. So in an engine, falls underneath that infrared transmitter and the code is received, you know that you know, you're at station ID number 42. Um, and clearly you can intuit that the system will therefore then go look for its current set of instructions for that um, uh, particular page. I'm never good, very good with animation, so I'm just gonna ask uh, Tracy here to flip through. Um, in any case, so uh, one of the reasons these tags are on Wi-Fi is uh, because they often need to interact with document management systems, other uh, document servers that sit out on the Ethernet. And that's exactly what happens here. Our system has a RESTful API, if, you're, um, if you have any amount of uh, software geek in you. Uh, basically, it's a simple way of communicating uh, between uh, software uh, packages 
that is independent of operating system. It, it's, uh, it relies on standard internet technologies. So in the same way, um, you know, the, the Amazon website you might surf to doesn't care whether you're coming from a Linux or a Windows box or what have you, because it just is isolated over the internet technologies. RESTful APIs do the same thing. And so we use RESTful APIs here to uh, query to the uh, document management systems for the next page, given that this is the engine ID number and given this is the uh, current location of, um, you know, the engine and its build process. So you get very specific instructions displayed to the operator uh, for that engine and for the only their operation. Okay, let's move ahead. Now, you know, a little detail here, but you can imagine that uh, you might not have just one page. You might have several pages uh, for uh, a given workstation. And so we, of course, allow you to download multiple pages um, for a specific workstation, and the operator can page back and forth, you know, kind of like a uh, Kindle reader. As a matter of fact, by the way, these uh, display technology, if you're interested, it's the exact same display technology they use in Kindle readers. It's the exact same e-paper is the uh, brand name for it. Now, interestingly, um, you you can see here that we can move back and forth. You see that we used infrared to tell you what um, location you're at. But uh, recently, we've been using the infrared also for uh, some other benefits, notably digital signatures. So, you know, you can use buttons for paging back and forth, yes, and you can use buttons to, you know, say yes and no and log certain operations. But uh, a couple of our customers have been asking for uh, the ability to kind of sign um, that uh, a step has been completed. And so what we do is uh, give that operator that needs to make a signature on the build book during the process essentially an infrared transmitter. And instead of transmitting a, a location code, we just reinterpret the code coming from that transmitter as a digital signature. And we can log it with uh, that particular build so that we can report, you know, who signed off on what particular operation as you flow down the uh, manufacturing line. So there's a lot of interesting and neat combinations you can do of, um, you know, with an electronic build book that you could absolutely not do with uh, paper. Um, and I just gave you a couple of examples there. Okay. Good. All right. Well, the customer was happy. That was, that's the first thing. And so why were they happy? Uh, most manufacturers get custom, uh, get uh, are happy because of numbers, <laughs> good numbers. <laughs> so in this particular case, uh, return on investment on just the paper savings loan occurred well within the uh, 12 months that we projected here. I, you know, the cost of seven million pieces of paper, printing them, running them out, um, and not only that, the latency in the uh, in the start of the build process due to the printing, all uh, were you know really uh, difficult cost factors that were eliminated with the introduction of this um, work instructions process flow. Um, the factory did actually win, I think, uh, at a green award uh, for removing paper from the process, which was very pleasant to see uh, from our perspective. Now, they are also able, some other side benefits to pop out, given that these are electronic build books, given that we know where they are, we can actually give them a real-time look at their WIP, their work in progress. So they know, uh, you know where a given engine is at any, any specific time. Um, and they can track things going forward. Now, you know with pieces of paper, you know where that blank engine block arrives at the beginning, but paper can't be tracked electronically. So you really, most people don't know exactly where all their, you know, the equivalent of their engine blocks are through those 60 or 70 stations until the next measuring point, which is often at the end of the assembly line. So the, you know, the, what happens in between in terms of WIP is often a black box, and this is what opens up uh, some visibility into that process. We were able to track these things electronically, report them on dashboards. So some neat side benefits. And there's a number of others that pop out here, but you can you can kind of intuit some of these. Okay. Oh, well, all right. Robert Hyden uh, is our main contact, main champion um, at Detroit. Uh, we've actually implemented not, lots of different lines since this original went in. Uh, we're going to talk about these different types of installs, but uh, you know, replenishments and work instructions, and, you know, we'll be looking at picking for this factory soon. But so we've got a lot of different uh, installs here. But it went well. And uh, overall, we're installed at a, probably, what did you say, around six or so OEM uh, automotive manufacturers, you know, the big name, name guys. Um, and then a bunch of uh, tier one manufacturers, you know, people that make the seats or make the electronic PCBs that deliver to the OEMs. 
And, in, and it's not all an automotive. We um, uh, have a, a good install at a white goods manufacturer, uh, a large tire manufacturer we, we work with. So, you know, anywhere where there's a fairly complex or interesting capital goods um, uh, manufacturing process where you deliver goods and, and materials are moving around dynamically, you know, in order to uh, assemble that uh, uh, item. That's a good spot for ProView. Okay. All right, more applications. So uh, we'll go into a couple of these, but uh, ProView, obviously, in the use of these visual tags, um, is designed to help all types of material flows. And uh, uh, we've classified them into work instructions that we've talked about, but also these four additional ones, replenishment or con automatic Kanban, picking or kitting, as it's sometimes known, and container management, which is a little bit, uh, it's a very specialized form of asset tracking, but uh, it's essentially um, allowing you to keep track of your containers. Uh, a lot of you folks might be using reusable containers. Sometimes they are shipped out of your factory and you expect them to come back and maybe they get lost on their way back or, uh, you might have sequenced containers that have specific kits built into them that have to be mated up with a specific car frame, and you want to keep track of exactly where those containers are and make sure that they maintain a sequenced FIFO ordering. You know, all those types of um, uh, container flows are managed by container management, as well as the obvious ones. Where are all my empty containers right at this very moment that fit, you know, dashboard for the Ford C-Max or something of that nature? You know, you might be looking for that next empty container and just don't happen to have it in front of you and want to find out where it is in the factory. Um, so those type of simple location and management problems are all handled in container management. So let's, with that brief introduction, um, when we'll go, I guess we'll go back a little bit to the value propositions here. We, there's a lot of different uh, problems we looked at solving when we were uh, first designing ProView, and here's a, a quick tour of some of them. Uh, these headaches are uh, uh, quotes from actual people um, in factories that we work with, uh, uh, and we've we've made sure that uh, ProView and the material flows that we've designed here, the replenishments and the picking, um, attack these very problems here. Hopefully, you guys can identify with some of these. Um, I've encountered these in one form or another. Um, without going through individual ones, let me focus on maybe just the one in the upper right there, parts are often delivered to the wrong station or out of sequence resulting in a write-off of whip or, or line stoppages is actually the rest of that quote there. Um, this is one that we've been encountering a lot lately. Uh, people building customized flows will build up kits, you know, let's say for a door or a dash panel, uh, a dashboard panel that has to be delivered and mated up with the exact right main body. Um, and of course, order is important and then the matching is important. And for the most part, they have big systems that work pretty well for this. Uh, but when it gets out of order, they often get off by one errors. You know, kit number 43 uh, might, for whatever mysterious reason, be mated up with kit uh, with body number 42. Uh, or, you know, body 42 comes along and all of a sudden they see body or kit number 44 in its place and they're wondering where the heck kit 43 went. And they got to go locate it and get it back in order. Um, all of those types of problems. Um, are, are really good examples of uh, how ProView uh, can simplify the flow of materials. We use uh, the, the electronic nature of ProView's tracking and capabilities and the constant uh, updating of the labels to uh, let you know where these goods are and maintain that order. And in fact, we will use it uh, for signaling errors. So if you deliver kit number 44, to be built onto card number 43, we can actually uh, begin flashing the uh, labels on that container saying, oops, wrong body, um, bring me somewhere else. And in fact, one of our tier one customers uses ProView for this very reason. They've noted through study after study, they're only able to get up to three sigma with a human um, in the loop and, and managing the uh, process. And in fact, most studies corroborate this. Three sigma is about the limit for a human being uh, operating over a long period of time. But they want to get to Six Sigma. They can't take the human completely out of the loop. Uh, robots are either way, way too expensive or, or just not there yet in technology. So how do you get to Six Sigma if you've got to put a human there? Well, the answer is you augment with technology. And what we just talked about is a perfect example. Uh, if you're charged with bringing the right sequence part number to the line at the right time, but you happen to make a mistake, that tag will automatically know that it's in the wrong spot and 
tell the operator and make it very, very obvious. Um, we'll see other examples of that picking and um, et cetera, et cetera. So let's move on. Um, yeah, I think we've talked through most of this, but the, the, the key observation, by the way, that we made, just a quick story about how we got here is you know, we were building RFID tags, and at one point about 10 years ago, it was thought that RFID would make paper obsolete in factories. And, of course, we were on the leading edge of that um, uh, uh, marketplace hope and wish. And while RFID has made some good inroads, um, it certainly by no means has replaced all the paper. And we went into the factories and we found some really crazy things. We would go up to these containers and sure enough, they'd have our RFID tags on them, but people would be putting paper labels over our tags. You know, the bottom line is that, um, you know, the RFID tag will tell you where in the factory your container is. But knowing now that there's a congestion or knowing that um, it's lost over here doesn't help the factory op uh, operator on the floor. They need to be able to look at something easily. And factories, are, um, we have found, are very, very adverse to asking their folks to carry tablets, scanners, or God help them, like Google Glasses or something like that. They want to be completely hands-free. And in many cases, union rules um, prevent certain classes of workers from operating with PCs altogether, tablets or anything like that. So uh, simple, readable, paper-like technology is exactly what they're after. And so what we did was to you know, combine the obvious, the advantages of the tracking of RFID and now, today, all the more rich IoT technologies with the visual um, advantages you get from simple pieces of paper. And that's, of course, in our e-paper displays. Now, we've been talking about visual tags here a lot, but some of our ProView installations get combined with other technologies. We have active tags where you don't happen to need um, uh, visual. So a good example of that is Automotive manufacturers will build uh, lots of cars and store them in a finished good lot, uh, which is a, a very large parking lot with acres and acres of cars, and they need to put them in and then be able to find the exact right car to load them up on train cars or, or you know, trailers. So knowing where they are parked in the lot, you know, you don't need to require a visual tag for that. You just need to have a map available on your forklift, or excuse me, your driver's, um, you know, dashboard there, uh, the tablet dashboard. So sometimes we do things like that too. But usually, visual tags is a, as a the visual aspect adds a really important um, aspect here. Let's move on. We'll try to pick up the pace here. Uh, so I'd actually like to come back to this slide here, but uh, uh, a little bit later, at least verbally. But the important point here is that we've designed ProView to handle 80 to 90 percent of all the material flows that you see in your factory. Let me tell you what we don't do, though. You know, we are not intending to be a replacement for your ERP system. We are not intending to be a replacement for your MES system, and we are not intending to be a warehouse management system. Uh, now, outside of that, there's still a lot of material flow movements that need to occur in the factory, and that is what we intend to do. And so you see here pictures of moving goods from the warehouse up to the back of, let's say, a picking line, you know, so you can replenish the bins that ultimately support a picking or kitting operation. We support directly that picking and kitting operation itself and then the subsequent delivery of that kit to, let's say, either a sub-assembly line or a final main assembly line. We do uh, bulk replenishment, individual part number replenishment, and also sequenced or sequenced kit replenishments. Um, we kind of alluded to this before. Um, and of course, we do container management, which is, you can kind of think of as a uh, an underlying um, uh, ubiquitous available service, right? You keep control of the pool of containers you have. And your replenishment and your pick and your work instructions utilize those containers managed by our container management application to get their job done. But those container management operating in conjunction with uh, those other workflows makes a really powerful combination. And to our knowledge so far, um, yes, there are other solutions like uh, pick to light solutions to do individual workflows or, you know, we've seen a lot of um, replenishment solutions uh, from other folks, everything from uh, the equivalent of bicycle flags going up to, you know, electronic call buttons. But to our knowledge, uh, the ProView system is the only um, uh, IoT solution that is able to cover all of replenishment, picking, container management, um, work instructions, all with one tag and one, basically one system. So you don't need to have multiple systems communicate. And that's where a lot of power comes from. Um, it would take, I don't want to bore you too much with details here, but uh, you can imagine that you can track 
uh, the delivery of goods to the back of the picking all the way through to the picking operation itself and everything being completely demand driven from demand coming from the main line. So with just giving us order information, the sequence order you want to you want to build in, we can maintain that flow of sequence delivery of parts um, in a kind of demand driven basis. Um, and then if things come out of order because of QA issues or things getting lost, you know, the container management takes over and lets you know where things are. Gives you that real time visibility. So kind of neat that way. Um, Let's move ahead. All right, the software, as I said, um, we have modularized our ProView capabilities and a bunch of different uh, uh, material flows, and we reflect that right in the software. So uh, you've got uh, replenishment and work instructions. In other words, you buy the modules you want. Um, and many of them will start working, you know, together um, in concert with each other as you buy pairs of them. You know, uh, picking and container management is a very popular pair. You might pick and do a container, uh, enough parts to build a dashboard, and then that container being managed by container management would, would quote unquote route itself over to the assembly area where that dashboard with its kitted parts is now assembled. Um, and then maybe that assembled dashboard now gets, you know, uh, is pulled to the main assembly line uh, by its sequence number. And so that might be a replenishment. And so replenishment will call into the container management pool of containers asking for uh, kitted up kit, uh, dashboard kit number, you know, 43. So you get complete traceability um, and complete visibility from stem to stern, okay? Other quick point to make here, again, we don't replace ERPs, MES, but we have to work with them. So when I talk about getting the sequence order, you know, we don't get into the uh, uh, scheduling that an MES does. We'll ask the MES for the sequence numbers and their order. Um, ERPs, we don't try to do inventories and match them up to shipping or, you know, ASNs or POs. That's good, an ERP, to do that. But we will tell the ERP system when replenishment yanks, you know, a number of parts from a, from a warehouse. And there are many, many, many different types of interfaces. We have a very rich API that allows you to do as little or as much as you want to gain information and interact. Cool. Next. All right. I'm going to try to move through these quickly because uh, I know we're, we're, we want to allow some time for questions here. But uh, just going to highlight a few of these workflows. Replenishment, um, as you would imagine by the name, is the delivery of parts uh, uh, right to the point where they are assembled, the point of need, usually a, uh, a station on an assembly line. Okay. So uh, there, like I alluded to before, there's a number of uh, variants where you can just ask for bulk parts. Hey, my bin is becoming empty of, bin, of bolts. I need more bolts, <laughs> and we get more of bolts of that part number. Or they could be asking for specific uh, containers that are sequenced. Um, you know, so a lot of different ways to set this up. Now, the way we usually have this is there's uh, two or three main players here. One is the consumer, obviously the guy who's pulling the bolts out of the bin at the, at the line. When that bin becomes empty, he pushes a button to call for more bolts. And uh, a driver, some people call them water spiders or runners or tugger operators, but let's call them a driver for now. Uh, we'll have a dashboard. Uh, it might be, by the way, permanently mounted up in the ceiling, so it's kind of a bulletin board type of thing. Or it could be a dashboard mounted on their um, uh, forklift. And uh, they will see a job request asking to replenish, and they'll go ahead and do it. And uh, you can imagine the operator has kept up to date that their request is being recognized, it's being picked, it's on its way for delivery, and it's here, et cetera, et cetera, so they get full retail, real-time feedback, and the drivers get um, uh, actual calls uh, for replenishments. And you know, we found a lot of replenishment systems operate more on a uh, kind of a traveling water spider who just walks around the plant looking for empty bins, and we've improved efficiency dramatically by actually directing um, drivers to specific points of need just by that mechanism alone. So, Lots of different ways to use this here. Okay. All right. Picking is uh, exactly as you would expect. A lot of different operations call for yanking a relatively small number of parts out of a very large set of possibilities in order to get uh, these parts ready for assembly. Um, we, uh, I guess you could consider us competing directly with a pick to light system. And in a lot of ways, we operate just like that, uh, except that we are not wired. Uh, we are completely wireless, uh, and so reconfiguration and, and actually installation um, has some really great advantages over tr uh, traditional pick to light. 
Uh, first of all, it's a lot less expensive per bin. You know, you can imagine, you know, a battery-powered tag. Oh, by the way, I don't think I mentioned, but these tags are not hundreds of dollars a piece. They are tens of dollars a piece uh, for the small format tag. So they're very, very uh, affordable. And actually, they're, um, generally speaking, they're actually less money, these whole visual tags are, than um, equivalent active tags you might have heard from our competitors in the market. They're actually less expensive. Um, so they're very affordable here. So in, uh, we'll use these uh, tags as individual pick to light uh, bin shelf tags. Uh, but a lot of our uh, customers will just simply Velcro them to the uh, uh, front of the shelf so that if they get another set of bins in uh, because of a different program or uh, for whatever reason they want to just move the location of objects around on the shelves, they just unstick the tag and stick it in its new place and off you go. I mean, it's highly configurable um, and very, very simple to install. You know, no wiring, you know, no reason to pull in your union um, IT guys or facilities guys do an awful lot of... Uh, wiring or DC or anything of that nature. Okay, So really good application there for picking and kidding. All right, um, container management, I think we talked a lot about already, So, but this is an underlying pool of containers and we do real-time location tracking and um, you can actually uh, have a number of triggers uh, programmed so that you can display specific displays and informations um, at different points in time. So, you know, a container under container management might say, at one moment I'm full and I'm in transit and I'm supposed to be at line 42. So a little bit like putting your kid on the bus with a um, you know, uh, note stuck to his uh, sweater saying, I should be at elementary school 43. <laughs> you know, you could say the same thing on your bins here and they should uh, uh, you know, be able to help anyone that walks up to them know what needs to be done with that. And then as soon as they get emptied, you know, for whatever, any number of triggers to indicate that the bin has become empty, they may say, hey, I'm now empty, bring me back to, you know, container return point, you know, 42. So context can uh, signal different instructions there, um, and that makes them very, very powerful. Plus, you get the ability to look in real time at where these things are. So you can ask questions are like, where the heck are all my empty bins for, you know, this such and such program? You know, I need them here now. Go out and fetch them. Here they are. All right, moving on. Um, asset tracking, so, you know, a common function, if we can do all the other things, a common function, obviously, is to be able to track assets, generally speaking. In factory environments, you know, we'll often think about asset tracking for finished goods or asset tracking for uh, WIP and, or asset tracking for tooling like molds or bits or, you know, those types of things. So that's obviously a function that we'll offer as well. Good. So this is just a summary slide, which is my signal to... Uh, know that I'm at the end, <laughs> but a really good, um, a quick wrap up is uh, ProView is about uh, combining the best of RFID or IoT with the simplicity of paper, and we love to work in large capital goods manufacturing. And um, uh, if if you guys uh, have questions, I would really like to hear about them. Um, if you have questions about the capabilities or where we've used it elsewhere or types of uh, um, you know, IT issues or software, how we interface with software, all those are really great opportunities to have a little bit of interchange here. Okay, Michael, let's open it up. Yeah, thank you, George, for that great presentation. And we have received a few questions for our AIM webinar Q&A session. Uh, cool. If people have a question, uh, if you go to the top right of your screen, you can click the chat icon up there, type your question to me, and I will read it here to uh, George. So. If you're ready now, George, we can start. Sure, absolutely. Yep. How would you recommend getting started with an IoT-based application like ProView? Yeah, so, yeah, I, we found that um, IoT is an incredible buzzword that everyone is speaking about, when you, but when it actually comes to implement it, you know, it, it, it just has such a wide, broad meaning. It's not very specific. It's not like saying we're moving over to Blu-ray discs where you know exactly what to do. Um, our advice here is to uh, build out small. Don't start from the top and look for a system-wide plant turnover to a whole new set of technologies. And that's, in fact, how we, we, we took our own advice when we designed the product here. That's how we designed the system. Um, you know, you might say, okay, look, I've got a, a paper-driven factory right now, but it's operating. We definitely want to fix things, but I don't want to uh, endanger the reliability that I already have. 
So what I'm going to do is just focus on delivering replenishment, delivering parts to this part of the line and see how it goes. As we build out little bits of automation, and if nothing else, throughout my presentation, you probably got the message that this is a very modular design that allows you to connect um, together as you go. The other very nice piece here, especially with ProView, is that it does take the place of paper pretty directly. You don't have to retrain operators. If you know how to read pieces of paper today, you know how to read a workbook or a visual tag tomorrow. And you can also take advantage of that very fact to continue using paper. And so that's actually a trigger point for us to know that the pilot is done and we're on full commercial operation. They'll continue to use paper along with our system, and then when they stop using paper, uh, we know that they're comfortable, um, and off they go. So you can use them side by side in our particular instance um, as you do the install and get comfortable with the, uh, the technology. Okay, great. Uh, a two-part question here. Uh, what do you see as the future of industrial IoT, and where can it improve? All right. So IoT is used to solve lots and lots of different problems. Uh, some people, in fact, IBM has a great series of commercials going around today where they have that IBM Watson talking primarily about predictive maintenance, and that's one good, strong area that I think we're going to see a lot of advancement in. Admittedly, by the way, that's not an area we're focusing on. Another area that we are focusing on, though, is um, visualization of movements of goods through your factory. We think this is one of the most important problems to solve, in fact, in capital goods manufacturing. Uh, today, uh, most factories track large populations of goods um, statistically as groups. Sometimes we use the word as unserialized. Uh, meaning they don't have individual identities. You say, I have 100 bolts, <laughs> and they're going to move as a group of 100 over to here. Um, even some things that are important to be serialized, they don't have the ability to track. At best, sometimes they have what we call last seen or checkpoint tracking, where you know you might uh, carefully measure things as they come in the door, and you carefully measure things as you go out the door, but what happens in between, it's too expensive to put all that monitoring in there. That monitoring might take the form of barcode reading or things of that nature. So what we're about here is trying to in the, and trying to move this vision of the future forward is to allow you to track in real time every bit and piece that flows through your factory. In fact, ProView, you might think, is actually a play on the visual tags. It's actually not. It stands for process view. You are able to see where all your things are flowing through the factory. That means that your goods become smart goods. The cost of these tags should continue to drop. And in fact, already at Omni, we have the visual tags, but we have these passives. And so in theory, um, you can tag items for as little as 10, 20 cents each. We're not quite at the point where, you know, for less than a cent, you can tag bolts. But I do see uh, the cost points over the next uh, 10, 15 years moving down. The other important thing to look for is the interaction of these systems. You know, we work with you know, one of our major investors is GE. And they have a, a number of products like Predix. It's kind of the equivalent of uh, IBM Watson. Um, but in any case, you're going to see more and more IoT backplanes into which you can plug in IoT systems like ours. They can do individual jobs, but then share information. Much like today, in a factory, you have a, uh, an inventory management backplane and materials backplane we call ERP systems. But you can plug in different uh, subsystems like us to help you, or a warehouse management system, let's say, to help you, um, you know, do sub jobs of the overall job of keeping track of your T resources. So, IoT should do the same thing as we move forward. We get standard interfaces to plug into, but that that some of that ubiquitous standard plug and play stuff is still um, on the horizon. So there's room for innovation and costing down these technologies for RFID to get you to, to allow you to tag more and more and see more and more in terms of sensors, and then there's room in the software arena for standardization of IoT systems to allow you to um, interchange and have these things work together, even if they're not um, designed by the same company. Okay, great. Another question we received was, what were the biggest issues you had in the plant adjusting to the application? Right, right. So, yeah, that's a good one. Um, Occasionally, some, so occasionally with the B10s, we would have a, we would, uh, Wi-Fi coverage was an issue. Would that be? There's nothing exotic to specific to the, the technology here, but it, uh, most fact 
factories um, want to cover certain areas, and so we. But other materials flow all over the factory, so sometimes we'll need to ask for uh, additional coverage on wireless access points. Um, uh, we'll often work with the IT teams um, at um, uh, at these places to create uh, what we call glue logic to mate up our RESTful APIs to their systems. And so there's a little bit of work ahead of time sometimes to do that. But as we've been doing more and more of these things over the last two or three years, we've built up a bag of tricks, if you will, or you know, a, a set of different interfaces. So that step has become smaller and smaller um, as you know, it's getting harder and harder to surprise us is maybe one way to say it. Uh, one common concern that people do have is, um, you know, wireless interference. And generally speaking, we're, we're pretty good about that, um, uh, dealing with that. We deal with um, RFID, which is a very mature technology nowadays, so uh, that works out really well. Our Wi-Fi, as you know, everyone and their brother uses that, so most interferences use it and work out there. And the only other wireless technology we'll use is 433 megahertz, but that sits by itself in the band and tends not to get um, uh, interfered with other things. We've had one rare circumstance where uh, we went into a factory where they actually made key fobs. Uh, these are the new modern keys that you use to um, start your cars or open up car doors, and they happen to operate on uh, 433. But we just went to a new channel and, and uh, fixed that up. So. Um, you know, it's it's made to go in pretty straightforward as a replacement for paper. We designed it from the ground up to make sure that we don't encounter too many too many issues. Another question we received is uh, the asset tracking seems practical for many businesses. Have you worked with any retail stores? Uh, and yeah. if not, do you see that in the future? Yeah, so uh, that's so. In the, my very first slide, uh, you remember I painted a picture of two divisions in our company. ProView we talked about here because this is AIM, and you guys are in manufacturing, building things, and so that was the net division we naturally talked about. But you're right. On the other side, our Generalized Enterprise Asset Management Group uh, does um, um, asset management for a lot of different companies. We do a lot of work for oil and gas. Um, and uh, all sorts of contract and manufacturing services, the big names you would recognize. You know, they bring lots of equipment on site, dump it down to do a fracking exploration, and then they pile it all back in the truck and bring it home. They want to make sure they get everything. Um, even a, we do a bunch of IT data center type places where, uh, for example, we have a really large install with um, a, the largest social media company um, out there uh, that. Um, it really, they have so many servers and routers coming in and out of that company, it's almost like a manufacturing flow. So we actually installed Provi there, but it started out as a general um, enterprise asset management, just keeping track of their servers. So that's another case. Uh, Marine Corps, Department of Defense, we do a lot of stuff tracking their, um, uh, their gun, everything from the small guns. Um, you know, they want to keep those in crates, but make sure they're still in the crates without having to open up the crates <laughs> all along the way. You can imagine the need to do that. Um, all the way up to the big rolling stock, you know, the big trucks and stuff. We track all that stuff with them. Um, we have tags in space. We do um, uh, tracking of the assets that go up to the International Space Station. So, uh, yeah, that's a big part of our business. And we have some really crazy, uh, interesting, crazy jobs. Um, everything tracking pigs to tracking uh, rickshaws in Bangladesh tracking shipping container. We have the very largest RFID deployment in India, trapping shipping containers, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's a fun business from that respect, if you're never bored. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, another question we received, do you see this technology, I guess, industrial IoT technology, having a significant impact in sustainability? Sustainability. Uh, so that in the sense of green? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, in fact, that's actually one of our pitches, right? You can imagine we market this um, as a, a paper reducer. And as I mentioned earlier, um, one of our factories got significant recognition. I think they actually, in part for winning this award and I think one other award, they actually, I think they got a visit from the President of the United States <laughs> because it was an example of eliminating paper and, and wastage and such. Uh, so you can you can well imagine that that's one of the ways we market it. but. Um, one of the interesting ways we we also have been working with our our customers and potential customers is to um, 
the really clever and creative ones will actually look for grants from their local governments and federal governments to help subsidize or fund the technology if it reduces the amount of landfill or um, that sort of thing. And so these those types of grants can be used to um, help fund these types of things. So yeah, we do we do take pride in making a, allowing a few more trees to live every day. So it is a big part of what we do, but it's primarily on uh, paper savings, I guess, would be the biggest impact. Okay, great. And our last question. Um, yeah. Where do I get more information on how ProView works? Sure. Um, so on the slide that we have showing is our um, uh, website, and that'd be a, a good first introductory place. And uh, keep your eye on that uh, website, though. I know that we, uh, Tracy here next to me, does a really fantastic job of keeping it updated with case studies and white papers. And um, I know we, over the next couple of quarters we're going to be working on that. You also have my email address uh, sitting there, so uh, a quick inquiry or just in, even an introduction would uh, you could you can initiate through that. And then on our website, we have the traditional contact us type stuff. So uh, many times we have folks whose job it is to go out and talk with you. Um, so if, if we get to that point in the conversation where it gets a little bit beyond exploratory, we can definitely send some people out. We have um, uh, Omni Ideas locations all over the world. We're in North America, in England, and in Europe. I guess you've got to separate those two now. Uh, we're in China. Uh, we're in India you know, with actual physical Omni-ID locations. So we can send people locally out to you from any of those places. Hey, well, great. Uh, thank you again, George, for your insight and knowledge and for providing us with this presentation today. No, it was fun, and I, uh, I, hope, uh, I hope I do hear from some of you folks. I know we've structured this as a broadcast, but uh, don't hesitate to use that email. I'd love to get into an actual conversation with you. And thank you to our audience for their active participation. I hope that you all found this information to be valuable. And thank you, and have a great day. Thank you, Michael. Yep, thank, thank you, you George. All.